Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, everybody. And uh, Mike Wood's my name. Uh, I'm uh, chair of TC106 in the IEC, which is a technical committee that looks after all of the um, uh, development of the um, electromagnetic field safety standards um, for 5G and for all of the wireless networks uh, and wireless devices. But it's a pleasure to welcome you here today to join us on this uh, webinar or this, uh, this live 5G uh, networking session where we're going to explore um, the latest um, updates on 5G, all of the benefits of 5G and what we're seeing in terms of the 5G ecosystem. So we're going to explore that to start with with a great range of panelists that have uh, agreed to kindly join me uh, today. And we're also going to look at the safety of 5G. So towards the end of the session in the second part, we're going to look at, uh, you know, what the latest safety standards are, the testing that's been done on devices, the testing that's been done on networks. And I'd like you to think about your own um, environment or your own um, connected home or your own connected workplace. How many devices would you have in your home? We've just done a study um, using the standards or the will feed into the standards developed by the IEC where we've connected a smart apartment, a 5G connected smart apartment with over 50, 50 wireless devices. And uh, we're going to share with you the results of the uh, EMF safety testing that we've done in one of these uh, apartments uh, over the past couple of months. So we're going to share that a little bit later. But have a think about um, how many devices you've got in your place. And with everybody, a lot of people working from home, schooling from home, entertaining at home. And the year of 2020 has certainly been very different to one that we've uh, experienced previously. Have a think about all of those devices and uh, what you might think the um, electromagnetic field levels might be and we'll let you into uh, what the results of the uh, testing that we've done. But first of all, let's meet the panellists. As I said, Mike Wood's my name. I've got the privilege of chairing uh, TC106 and I also work for the uh, mobile operator Telstra in Australia. So we've got uh, five or six panellists with me and I'm going to throw first of all to Sammy if you'd like to introduce yourself, Sammy. Hello everyone, my name is Sammy Gabriel. I work for the Vodafone Group and I am one of the conveners on the IEC um, TC106 working groups, writing the standards for um, base stations, handsets, um, IoT devices. So um, I, I work across all of these aspects with a great team of people here. Fantastic, thank you, Sammy. Um, and Thomas, uh, would you like to introduce yourself from Austria? Yeah, thanks, Mike. My name is Thomas Baumüller and I work for the Mobile and Wireless Forum uh, in my capacity of director EMEA. For, I'm responsible for the um, operations of our association in Europe, Middle East and Africa, including Russia. And I also participate in TC106X in standardization issues. Thank you, Thomas. And look, working from the Manufacturers Forum, um, I guess you'll give us some insights as to uh, you know the number of devices. In fact, a brand new 5G device arrived at my place by courier earlier today. It must have been a sign that this forum was on. But I look forward to hearing the latest on the number of devices. We're coming up to Christmas, and it seems to me that there's a new device launched uh, every day at the moment. But uh, thank you, Thomas, for joining us, and we'll come back to you shortly. Um, Matt, um, in, in Australia also, um, I understand you're heavily involved in the smart cities uh, area, Matt. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Mike, and, and good evening or good morning to everyone. Um, yeah, my name's uh, Matt Schultz. Um, I'm the president of the Australian Smart Communities Association. Um, I'm uh, also involved in the G20 Global Smart Cities Alliance as the digital infrastructure co-chair. Um, and uh, yeah, very involved in um, the smart cities and digital uh, connectivity and digital infrastructure development space. Uh, I'm also a director of a consultancy firm in Australia called Gravel Road Group. Um, and we're doing a, a bunch of work um, around 5G enablement uh, for, for cities and regions in Australia. Fantastic, Matt. And I look forward to exploring some of the, the big opportunities you see ahead for 5G as the, um, you know, the smart cities evolve. And finally, I think we have Ian on board, Ian Opperman, also from Australia. Uh, which, welcome, and uh, if you could just, I think you're, you're our, the newest council board member, so congratulations on that. And if you'd like to introduce yourself, Ian. 
Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm the troublemaker. Uh, recently elected to the Council Board, start next year. So I've spent six years with the Market Strategy Board of the IEC, also the National Committee President for Australia. Uh, my day job is actually the Chief Data Scientist for the New South Wales Government, but I've also been leading the uh, Smart Cities Advisory Council for the New South Wales Government and the Smart City Standardisation Activity for, for Standards Australia. And really excited about being here. And I have to, I cannot get away without saying, I'm also, I chair the Scientific Advisory Board for the 6G mobile activity, which kicked off in Finland a couple of years ago. And so whilst I know we must make business from 5G, the research world at least is already thinking about 6G. Absolutely. And look, it's, it, is a, it is a journey. And I, I don't, I think I've got 6G as a prompt uh, towards the end. And of course, you, you published that great paper recently about uh, the road to 2030. And we'll explore some of that. So what we'll do for the next uh, few minutes is I'm just going to set the scene with where 5G is at and the evolution, how, you know, where we've got to and some of the things that 5G is going to enable. And then we'll open up the conversation with some of the questions that have come in from the people that registered. So thank you very much. And in the true spirit of the IEC, if we don't know the answer to your question, uh, then I'm sure with the collaboration and all of the people involved, we can find you that answer, but we'll do our best to, uh, to answer your questions. Now I'm gonna share my screen and I'm just gonna show just a very short uh, a few slides that just set the scene. And I did practice this before, so I hope it is gonna share the right one. And uh, I'll put it into slideshow. So just wanting to make sure that, uh, and I've got to move this up to put it into slideshow. So before I move on, can I just check that you can actually see my screen before we move on? Thank you, thank you, Sammy. Um, okay, well, as we said to start with, um, if I move up, um, you know, welcome to this forum. It is the networking forum. The discussion topics we've talked about before, I'm just gonna give this short 5G recap and its features. Then we'll look about look at the, the, the devices and uh, you know talk about the major game changer and particularly on the road to 6G. And I did mention that, Ian. What can we learn in the IEC uh, you know, as we head towards 6G in 2030? So that will be something we maybe touch on at the end. And of course, the important questions on safety, we, um, we wanna talk about that. You've probably seen all of these before, but we can't get away without just mentioning that you know, it is every decade we get a new generation. So of course, in 10 years, we will be, we will be looking at that 6G and the roadmap to 6G. But we've seen you know, 2G with uh, you know, uh, SMS, 3G with the first mobile internet, 4G, of course, with enhanced uh, mobile broadband, and then 5G, you know, the connection of everything. And I, I hate to admit this, but I think I've nearly owned almost all of the devices that you can see on this screen. I haven't included the 5G ones yet, but we'll have to add some to there. Um, you know, we talk about 5G connecting the community and it's really gonna be, uh, you know, it's gonna be the connectivity of today's modern society and all of the internet of things and all of the innovations that we get into the future. And Matt, with the smart cities, I can't wait to see how this new connected world can certainly benefit in all of the things that we do. But just an image of a smart city or a connected community and what 5G is going to do. Um, you know, we mentioned it before, but it's going to offer, op open up a whole range of connectivity and benefits, you know, from smart cities to schools to transportation. I read a fantastic article recently about a 5G connected airport. Now, I don't know if that means that we'll never lose our luggage or that we can find the right gate or we can find the right lounge access. But um, if you think about seamless connectivity through any of the workplaces, healthcare, all the benefits to that and education, I'm gonna show you a couple of case studies that we've got live in Australia uh, towards the end and that'll prompt some of the discussion. But it is exciting where we are heading. We're not there yet, 4G is doing a lot, but what 5G can potentially do it is important just to mention the actual architecture because people talk about 5G and I don't know that everyone actually realises the, the way it actually works. So very quickly, you've got the radio access network, which is all the mobile phone towers and the mobile phone masts, as some people call them, uh, working collectively with 4G. And uh, there's improvements certainly in the radio, significant improvements in the radio access network. And I'm going to get the laser pointer if I... Uh, pointer option laser, here we go. There's certainly improvements in the radio access network that are making things a lot more efficient in terms of spectral efficiency and how we use frequencies. 
but a significant part of the 5G ecosystem is what we call the core network, the, the actual digital network that connects everything. And we've got central cloud servers, but a key feature of 5G is going to be servers local to your community or local to an enterprise. Or, and they're often called edge, it's often referred to as edge compute or mobile edge compute. I'll show you a couple of examples of that later, but it's really about putting the compute behind the network much, much closer to the user. So the response time is much quicker and you've got improved security, improved access, particularly for some of the verticals and some of the enterprise applications. So if you think about how 5G is going to work, you've really got the advanced radio network and then you've got the compute, which is the core. Um, how do we access 5G? Well, at the moment, uh, a lot of operators are using the mid-band frequencies. So in the same band as the current mobile frequencies, just at the upper end at around 3.5 gigahertz. But to get the extended range, we're actually reusing and sharing some of the frequencies that the existing mobile users in the low bands. For example, in the US, they're using 600 megahertz. We will be using 700 and 800 in Australia. And for the high capacity um, you know, and high density areas, we're going to be using millimeter wave. And this is very short range communication, really with small cells, but it deals with very, very high capacity. So being able to use 5G across a range of frequencies is going to enable a number of applications and make 5G possible. One of the newest, and uh, we talked about, we, we said today, we we're going to talk about new aspects of 5G. Um, dynamic spectrum sharing, where you can actually use the same frequencies for 5G and 4G together, and it will switch depending on the traffic load. So that's a great feature that's going to enable the existing reuse of frequencies. So that's something that's probably coming to a marketplace uh, near you soon. How many connections do we have? So I went to the GSMA and I looked at the, the current stats. I think it was around the end of September. The current stats indicate that there's 106 commercial launches, maybe a little bit more by now, covering about 7% of the global population. And there's about 100, they're forecasting 190 million subscribers by the end of 2020. How does that stack up against the global market? Well, every year the GSMA produces a, a mobile economy report. This year at the end of 2019, I think you know, we had something like 5.2 billion unique mobile subscribers. They're forecasting about 5.8 billion by the end of 2025. Mobile internet users, um, well, we're talking about just, over, just under 4 billion and 5 billion by the end of 2025. So you're talking significant numbers here in terms of the global market. This is something that I really wanna point out in terms of this particular slide. Where does 4G fit? And when does 5G really take off? Now this is, the source here is from the Ericsson Mobility Report. And Ericsson are talking about their predictions are around just under 9 billion mobile connections by the end of 2025 which is significant. But if you look at the green area in the middle is the data that's supported by LTE or the current 4G networks. And here we are in 2020, where you can see the majority of data or the majority of applications are carried on 4G. And that's gonna continue for a significant portion of our time because 4G is a very, it's a fantastic technology and it's gonna underpin our connections for many years to come. And you can just start to see we're at the very start of the 5G ecosystem. We talked about 5G networks being built, but it's not really until 2025 that you're gonna see those major impacts. It's, gonna it's starting to happen and there's some, certainly some great use cases already. But if you look at this chart, it really shows you when the 5G data will start to make an impact. Many of you have probably seen this before. It's really the three classic, you know, three classic use cases for 5G. What we've got at the moment is really enhanced mobile broadband where we've got some higher speeds and higher capacity giving us higher throughput. When we go into the smart city arena, we've got massive machine to machine communications and the capacity of 5G networks will greatly be enhanced. I think it's gonna be something like 1 million devices per square kilometer. So if you think about a smart city being able to connect all of the sensors and then when we get standalone 5G networks, having those very low latency uh, applications like you know, mission critical applications, uh, automated industry applications, 
critical healthcare, self-driving cars, they're all going to be made up, you know, enabled through this ultra low latency aspect. To show some of that, um, this is something I saw, I think at the end of last year or start of this year, this is an application that runs off Australia or runs off the, the coast of New South Wales. Um, you'd all be familiar with our fantastic surf beaches, but we also have sharks and we also have, um, you know, surf rescues that need to occur. This is a mobile equipped drone. So we're partnering with uh, the um, um, Surf Life Saving Associations to look at how can 5G equipped drones uh, improve the, I guess, the resolution and the, the um, shark detection capabilities. Um, these little, these drones, they're quite significant in that they can drop a life buoy to a swimmer that's stranded out in the ocean or stranded at the beach before a rescuer can get out to them. So these are just a couple of images of the improved um, detection capability that 5G can bring with better virtual, you know, better algorithms and better, I guess, um, uh, you know, detection capability through the imagery. Um, one thing that I was very impressed with was training. Um, the ability to, and this was one example of, uh, you know, emergency rescue training using virtual reality. Now we witnessed this ourselves. We had one of these demonstrations where using a VR set, this particular person was able to feel the, the pressure and using the hose gun through the haptics of the suit. And they could experience firefighting at airports and putting out fires in cars. So this, this is just one application of VR through 5G that is gonna really help remote training and really help uh, in terms of future educational capabilities. One that um, I know most people are doing shopping online these days, but if you're if you happen to go to a store or if you happen to be, uh, you know, there's there's an application where we experience this, where if you've got a display of particular clothing range or a display of a particular feature, when you hold the phone up, it recognizes the um, in this case it recognized the clothing range, and then it brought you a an augmented reality view of the person walking down the catwalk towards you. And if I, this was all powered over 5G, and I think this was one of the Oppo apps. But if I show this, you can probably see someone walking down the catwalk. Now, this is just an example of a higher capacity um, application that 5G can enable. Um, I'm going to pause it there. And Thomas, one of the key questions that we had before we break into the conversation was how many devices um, are there on the market and what's available now? Now, I know that uh, I've popped something up on the screen here, but Thomas, would you like to take us through and just from the mobile perspective, just tell us about the number of devices and what we're likely to see going forward? Sure, Mike. It was not difficult being in a hard lockdown to do all the <laughs> homework. So, um, well, what I did, I actually looked up the numbers that are provided by the Global Supplier uh, Association. And by the end of October 2020, we had uh, 492 5G devices that were announced and 249 of them were commercially available. So the number of announced 5G devices has almost doubled since end March uh, 2020. And with regard to the commercially available um, devices, it's it, when we look at the last three months, an increase of more than 50%. I have to add that the number of 492 5G devices include regional variants and phones uh, that can be upgraded using a separate adapter, but they do not cover operator branded devices which are more or less rebadged versions of other phones. And I found it interesting that they have identified 99 vendors who had announced making available um, 5G devices. And it was also interesting to see that the uh, form factors that are already uh, offered not only include mobile phones, but go to laptops, modules, uh, industrial grade routers and gateways, but also drones, which you have just shown, robots, tablets, TVs, cameras, USBs, uh, and even vending machines with 5G. So I, I think it's really clear that uh, 5G penetrates all uh, areas. And when you think about Christmas, because we talked about that beforehand, then also all manufacturers, um, more or less all manufacturers of the mobile and wireless forum uh, make available 5G phones for Christmas. So if you think about that, then it would be a good time to look at it. 
Do you think that we're going to, one of the questions that came through was, uh, you know, in, 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 I guess in, in the registered questions was, are we, you know, are we going to see 5G in all of the devices by 2025? Will it just be every, every mobile device you have will have a 5G connection, be it a laptop, be it a computer? You've listed many there. Is that, is that going to be the normal from mid this decade or are we going to be having it earlier or where do you think that will be? Well, I don't think that by uh, 2025 in all devices uh, which are mentioned in all form factors, 5G will be um, available, but nevertheless, this is for sure the new normal uh, as soon as possible. And because of the benefits of 5G devices with the significantly faster speeds in data access, downloading and streaming content, uh, and, and also the increased computing uh, power, uh, not to speak about the, the lower latency, I, I do think uh, that these benefits of virtually instantaneous connections to networks and greater connectivity, um, that will pretty quickly penetrate all the uh, devices. Now, look, I think you're right. It's, it's certainly an exciting time when, you know, everything seems to, well, we're moving from a world where, you know, we had uh, enhanced mobile broadband to all devices connected. Um, Matt, you know, you talked about uh, in the introduction, you talked about smart cities and the role you play in, in sharing the smart city forum here. What do you think is the biggest opportunity that 5G can play in smart cities going forward? I mean, are we going to, are we never going to see a lost bag when we've got 5G enabled tags or what, what do you see as the biggest opportunity, Matt? Oh, look, look I, th I think, Mike, there's, there's a massive opportunity if full capability 5G can deliver what theoretically is, is promised by the, the technical specifications. So the, the, the ability for 5G as, as its own connectivity service to have the capability of the extra bandwidth, um, which we can see now through early 5G, but really like you mentioned earlier it's it's the addition of the ultra reliable low latency connectivity uh, capability and the, um, the the ability for 5g to handle a massive amount of concurrent connections um, the, the you know the, for, for IOT for internet of things uh, connectivity it, it, it could be massive um, in, in terms of its uh, role in, 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 in the digital connectivity that's required to power smart cities. Um, I, I don't know if it's going to be the, the, the one piece of connectivity technology to rule them all, but I, I think um, in time, as we see full capability 5G rolled out um, throughout the decade, um, it, it can play a massive part. The reason why is we will see a densification of connectivity um, in, in the urban and street environment. And, and that's why it's important um, we, we need um, the, the, the capability to connect up all these new sources of data that we will have. Um, it is inevitable, it will happen. And, um, you know, right now we, we need um, better fit for purpose connectivity uh, rolled out as, as, as quickly as we can to, to service those, uh, those outcomes and, and opportunities. Yeah, I think for operators, um, you know, it's a challenge of, um, I don't know whether people actually know this, but 5G was meant to be launched in 2020 at the Tokyo Olympics. Um, now, of course, the technical specifications uh, progressed quicker. It meant that we had to, uh, and they brought them forward two years. So 5G is actually being rolled out in, in a number of markets as, as non-standalone. It's working with 4G to enable some of this evolutionary pathway, if you like. Um, which is great because we're seeing, you know, we're getting a head start on, you know, what's going to happen in this decade. There was a question, Matt, that came in um, uh, through the registrations in terms of for a smart city and power stations and power grids and, you know, electricity supply, how will 5G help in that, in that overall context? I mean, I can see with so many um, suppliers and so many add-ons to the power grid these days, you know, that messaging and that synchronization and monitoring is critical. Do you think it's going to play a major role there? Oh, look, look, I think it, it might have the, the capability to do so. I think, um, again, through the, the network slicing capability of, of 5G as well to 
handle different types of connectivity means um, as part of the technology. So, for example, if you're managing a, a power grid or a smart grid, you, you need a different type of, uh, of, of connectivity requirement as you would if you were, um, you know, delivering a, a residential or business service. Um, so, so, yeah, look, I think it, it, it's got the, the opportunity. I think what we need to see is how it performs at scale and, and, and on, on the ground uh, in the next, you know, like I said, three to five to seven years as, it, as it's rolled out, when we've got all the spectrum bands that are available, um, when we've got release 16 and release 17 of the 3GPP standards, you know, when, when that's actually rolled out and, 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 and available as services, um, then we'll see, you know, how, how well it can actually play in, in, in the real world and, and, and do some of the things that we're hearing about it might be able to do. Yeah, you mentioned Spectrum. That's certainly key to, um, you know, key to the connectivity and key to, I showed the chart before of the Spectrum and having, having access to the broad range of millimetre wave for the enterprise applications that you know a, a power company might use or an airport might use to the longer range applications for IoT devices. Talking about IoT, um, Sammy, you've been involved in some of the IoT projects and and uh, and safety applications. What's your what's your take on how five G can you know what IoT can add, Sammy, from your perspective? Well, I think the, the fact that we can have connectivity going to so many devices, um, monitoring those devices and looking at how they are working, and in particular, that um, they're in a safe manner, they're working as expected, monitoring the, the power draw, monitoring the, the radio transmissions, all of these things now become capabilities for us at a much more granular level when we've seen devices working and we've assumed everything works perfectly it works all of the time um, having the ability to put that connectivity quite cost effectively into everything really gives us that monitoring and it's not an extra burden on us as people doing everything this is all work that goes on seamlessly in the background with the networks with the artificial intelligence monitoring these, but it makes our lives a lot richer, safer, and um, more, more, more efficient, really. Yeah, look, I think you're right. And the, I mean, it, it, it's like Matt was saying before, when you've got all of the IoT devices and modules in this connected world, um, you know, and you can seamlessly connect them, startups can get a great advantage because they're not fixed in, in where they can go. And there's, there's so many applications that could benefit from that. There's a question that's quite relevant in the, in the chat. Uh, um, should broadcasters be thinking about 5G for radio and TV? Well, in fact, at one of the forums that we ran recently, um, uh, one of the broadcasters here in Australia was using 5G for their outdoor broadcast. And they were using it for the uplink and also for streaming content back to the um, content back to the station. And they saw a huge potential for what it can do. But it, we've got to remember that 5G at the moment is running collectively with 4G and you've got the two networks uh, in, most, uh, in most markets uh, running co collectively together. But certainly, um, you know, I think um, broadcasters are thinking about that now. There'll be the broadcasting aspects of what they can do, but certainly for the content delivery and the outdoor applications, um, and, and at stadiums when you're delivering, you know, content uh, to people that are uh, enhanced user content uh, for people watching sports games, for example. Um, there was a question in the uh, registrations about what's the life duration of 5G? Now, we're really only just starting on that journey, but we know that every decade there's a new G. And Ian, you mentioned uh, you, you've already been to the first 6G or, or the second 6G conference. Um, in your, what do you, what do you think is going to be critical in the lead up to 2030 and, you know, how standards will evolve and what do you think the most critical aspect of 5G leading up to that magical 6G will be? Ian, from, from where you sit from a data analytics, um, and I know there's uh, the great paper you put into the, the IEC recently about all the potential, what's the biggest takeaway do you think? 
Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, so I hope everyone's read that paper. It was um, my attempt to basically explain to the IEC that if we don't change- I have to make it available in the, in the links, yeah. That, that's great. So if, if we don't change, we become less relevant, partly because the world is changing, partly because of the digitization, the connectivity and artificial intelligence as tech trends are changing things. But partly also, we know the climate is changing and we know the population is growing and aging. And the combination of those different factors means we've got some pretty big challenges, not least of which is productivity, not least of which is the fact that we're, we're going to operate in a changing world. 10 years is not that far in the future anymore. And it's a little artificial to talk about, you know, our, our G's are a bit like Moore's law. We, we keep pushing G's because we know that we have now got a rhythm associated with a new generation of technology basically being released every 10 years. So acknowledging all of the fact that it's, it's a little bit artificial. What's, what is true is that every G fails to deliver on the, the vision or the image of, of what we had thought it would be. 1G was a miracle. GSM, subsequently called 2G, was an amazing, amazing miracle. And we're all dumbfounded by what we could do. 3G was the first attempt to try and really get different quality of service, different data rates, and it, it led to some pretty serious challenges where coverage and capacity were no longer the same thing. So we had to start thinking about things differently. 4G was a big attempt to lift the capacity and the coverage. 5G is an attempt to really connect Internet of Things and again, boost the coverage and capacity and start to get really clever about use of those different bits of spectrum that were becoming ridiculously expensive when we saw 3G and 4G. 5G is a consolidation of many of those ideas. What we, what we will get from 6G is everything we learned from 5G. The, the spectrum you talked about, millimetre wave, it's already becoming pretty scarce territory. So we're talking about terahertz and we're talking about really exotic materials and exotic things. But what I really hope we get from 6G is the evolution of all the corners of capacity, coverage, latency, reliability, but also that really great diversity of density and the, the, the great difference between a device which can send or receive a bit per second or a bit per day versus the, the headline data rates of multiple gigabits per second, which at some point will, will probably peak out and it, there won't be that much, won't be useful to keep getting headline data rates. We also have seen some really phenomenal improvements in MIMO, uh, the antennas, multiple input, multiple output antennas. And it went from an interesting idea to being essential in the thinking of the evolution of 5G as spectrum starts to become much more readily shared from a spatial and temporal perspective, because we can form beams and we can, we can be much clearer about how we actually deliver those beams or receive those beams. So the upshot of, of that question is, 6G is a bit of, a, um, a, bit of a, a line in the sand. It almost certainly aligns with our Moore's law thinking. It's just the next big milestone or the next big collection. It'll be released. Uh, I'm not quite sure Matt, whether it will be released 20 or released 21 or released 22, but it'll effectively be the combination of all the tech that we've been evolving. It'll be the delivery on the promise of 5G that we couldn't deliver now but I think it will really stretch our thinking around whether we do need devices or whether devices can become more invisible, whether we can actually start talking about genuinely no power devices as opposed to low power. So, so devices which could be printed into or woven into fabric. So I think that stretch is not unreasonable 10 years from now, but I think also unfortunately 6G will fail to deliver on the promises that we're talking about right now. And so that, that means we're likely to have a 7G. And just that, that point about energy is, a, is an interesting one. There will be a point, just as there is now, where the amount of energy we spend on data centers and analytics is starting to become a problem. There will be a stage where we say, we've spent enough of our global energy budget on communications. So that ability to dial down or dial up the cost, the energy cost of communications will become a predominant factor. So those trends will drive 6G in a different direction, but ultimately 6G will be the delivery of the promise of 5G in many respects. Look, some great insights, Ian, and um, uh, sorry, Matt, did you want to offer a comment? I'm sorry. No, um, some great insights. And, you know, if you don't set the bar high and, you know, you've got to really set that bar high when you're setting the and the the one the G every every decade 
um, through the 3G um, PP project and the technical specifications is really a way to drive that innovation. And we see it every day, you know, if we, if we, if we could jump forward to 2030 and look back on this conversation now, we would all go, of course, we, we should have seen that that was gonna happen. Or Ian's paper was exactly right, or we should have added, added this bit to it. But, you know, I, I'm just excited by the possibilities that it's gonna deliver. Um, mindful of the time, one thing we've seen a lot of this year is 5G conspiracies. Now, I don't know uh, what the wildest conspiracy uh, you might have uh, seen is, or you might have heard, but we've also had some fantastic developments in the safety regime in, in terms of uh, 5G or in terms of safety standards for radio frequencies. I'm going to share my screen again and just take you through what the latest on the 5G safety is and then look at our testing in a smart apartment, which could be like a home that you have with many connected devices. So again, I'll share my screen and make sure I choose the right one. And it's uh, just eluded me for a second. Um, see if I can choose. Isn't it great how you show this and then something else is not coming up as it should. I've got to end. I'll see if this is going to work. Share screen. Sorry about that. Um, and it's not working. Why is that? I'm not sure what you can actually see. There it is. It's come back. So I'm now going to share. I stopped. Okay, I will share the screen again. My apologies for this. It's just uh, one of those things that. And okay, we're back to where we started. My apologies for that. Um, so in terms of safety, um, the first thing I wanted to highlight here in terms of safety is what are we actually talking about now for radio frequencies or for electromagnetic energy or electromagnetic fields and for all the systems we use, the most important point to understand is that we're operating in the radio frequency band and that's, not, that's in the non-ionizing spectrum. It's, um, it's not ionizing, and that's the most important aspect. Um, if we were, if we're, we're all familiar with ionizing radiation where we have part of the ultraviolet band, X-rays and radioactive sources, exposure to that form of radiation is not good. Exposure to non-ionizing radiation, you've got different safety standards in place. And the safety standards for radio frequencies are very conservative and they've just been renewed this year and we're gonna show you those. But the key point for 5G is that it's not magic. It uses radio frequencies, as we mentioned before, similar to 3G, 4G, and even in the millimeter wave band, it's well below the ionizing portion of the spectrum. In terms of the safety guidelines, you may not be aware, but in March 2020, the new international guidelines from a group called ICNERP, the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, they published their long awaited uh, review of the international safety guidelines. Importantly, it includes 5G, it covers 50 years of scientific research and they went through a thorough review of the science. In fact, they spent the best part of the last 10 years looking at the science and working out what the um, relevant expo excuse me, exposure limits should be. And importantly, it's conservative and protects all people. The chair of ICNERP or the chair of this commission um, in the media release that accompanied the release said, we know parts of the community are concerned about the safety of 5G and we hope the updated guidelines will help put people at ease. Now, one thing that I wanted to asset, you know, share with you today is how conservative these guidelines are. They weren't sure whether they'd have to change them to keep them the same or to in fact adjust them. And they, they have made some adjustments but overall the adjustments make sure that the exposure limits are very conservative. Um, in terms of millimeter wave, we've heard some recent, we've heard that uh, you know, there's, some, there's some concern that there hasn't been any research into the millimeter wave portion of the frequency band. Well, in fact, there has, there hasn't been as much as the rest of the RF band, but there has certainly been quite a number of research papers studied. 
In fact, millimetre wave has been used for decades for things like uh, radar communication, military communication, point to point, satellite uh, and um, scanners and so forth. There's been a lot of use for millimetre wave. If we look at the end of 2019, in fact, this chart from uh, the Mobile and Wireless Forum shows that there were, you know, there were just over 1400 publications in total. And this is the group of publications that the International Commission looked at when they were reviewing millimetre wave. So there certainly has been a lot of millimetre wave testing. Um, now, Thomas, you've, you've brought some, some of the research, the latest research to our attention for, for this call. And there's quite a bit of text on this screen, but I think they've just looked at the actual power levels on 5G devices and how they're operating in commercial networks. Can you just briefly tell us what they found from the real devices operating in the networks, Thomas? Yeah, sure. Well, I think it is important, and this is also pointed out in this really latest research um, on user equipment and what are the actual uh, output power levels of these devices, that these um, measurements are in line with what we have seen in 3G and 4G user equipment, which means that the actual power that is used to establish and uh, guarantee a connection is very low. And we talk here about commercially uh, available or commercial 5G networks. And as you can see in the second paragraph, it's mentioned that uh, time average output power is always less than 43% of the maximum time averaged user equipment output power. And I think this is a very um, actually should calm concerns of people who are thinking about the exposure which they get from um, the equipment when, when they use it. And um, I, I do think that we have to continue to spread this news um, and make sure that people are aware that what, whatever is measured with regard to devices, when it, we talk about compliance of devices, these are not the actual levels they are exposed to. Also, even these levels are only fractions of fractions of the level of harm. And I think this so is really just what you're saying is that the testing is done at maximum but the actual use power, the power that, you know, of the device when it's being used is way down. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly uh, what this research also shows. And again, in line with what we have seen in 3G, 4G and 5G, because we also have to be um, aware that nevertheless, we are th thinking about 6G, these other technologies will stay around for quite some time. And as mentioned, the actual power that is used to communicate in networks is very, very low compared to even that was is measured in uh, compliance testing. And I, I think it's just um, important to point out how conservative our standards are with regard to the actual- I think that should reassure a lot of people because I know that, uh, you know, when people go, look, with all of these Gs, I know the phone can do more and more is it using more power? Well, the screen might heat up and the batch, you know, you might be using more compute power or you might be using applications, but the radio part of the phone is using the lowest possible power. And that's, that's really what this research is showing. Is that right, Thomas? That's correct. And I think we also have to point to the network side in this regard, because also on the network side, the exposure has not increased by introducing new technologies because they are more energy efficient and things like that. But I do think that uh, Sammy can tell more about these measurements and sure. we have seen. Look, that's, a good, that's a good segue. I, I'll move on because um, Sammy, you've been involved in um, TC106, which is the group uh, that I chair and leading one of the projects on the, um, you know, the device side and on the base station side. The point of showing this is that uh, we wanted to be ready for 5G so that we, we that was part of our, uh, part of our strategic business plan we had to make sure that we were ready two years earlier. And we did that through some innovative ways of developing technical reports so that we were ready for launch. And we're now in the throes of, uh, you know, producing the updated standards for base stations and the updated standards for devices. Um, but in terms of networks, Sammy, um, we moved to an area where, and if I look on the screen here, the old 4G networks transmitted in all directions uh, uniformly Whereas with 5G, you're really looking at MIMO beam steering and minimizing transmissions. 
Can you comment on any of the testing or the research that you've seen, Sammy, um, yep. in terms of what the actual levels are like? Sure. Um, you know, really, this is very much a synergy, as Thomas was saying, that the handsets and devices have the capability to increase and reduce their power over a very broad range. And the networks are now doing the same thing, not just by increasing and reducing the power that they can transmit from any of these base station antennas, but this new technology um, with multiple individual beams really coming out means that they are hugely more efficient in the power that they use so that they can direct that field just towards where it's needed. And they can do that in a very precise manner. Some of these base stations can handle a huge number of users or devices. You know, it could be pieces of equipment, it could be individuals with a handset, it could be vehicles as we have in the picture here, and just directing the network service in their, their area. Therefore, other areas with no devices, no active users, no need for the coverage in the service, don't get any of the um, radio fields broadcast in that direction. So overall energy efficiency for the base station goes up, efficiency of use of the spectrum and all of our other limited resources goes up. Um, and it's really, a, it's a win-win for both the consumer and the, the devices that are being operated, as well as us as the network operator being able to do this. Look, you, you raised some really good points there because on the, on the device side, it's operating at the lowest possible power and on the network side, it's doing the same. And by this optimization of the network, we're actually seeing many, many more devices, but the exposure levels are coming down. Yes. And uh, yeah, that, that's certainly the case that it is reducing the exposure levels there because you're not broadcasting when you don't need to. And that now that we've got a good population of 5G devices out there, we're monitoring the efficiency of this. And it is looking at these sort of use cases that have been taken back now into the standardization area. We've been able to update the standards to actually evaluate real world scenarios. And yep. this is the way that we need to be moving forward is looking at the real world scenarios that we are going to be uh, exposed to a degree uh, of RF moving forward. And it is being able to have the ability to monitor that and to regulate for it and it is a synergy that we can all live with. Well I mentioned before about um, um, it's a really great segue into how many devices do you have in your homes so if you think about how many devices um, you've got currently at your place if you think about that building we showed you just before I'm going to share with you um, a the results of what we did in terms of a um, uh, I'll bring this back up and hopefully it's going to display. No, it hasn't come back up. There it is. I just want to change slides and show change to this one. And I think I have to reshare my apologies. I'm going to reshare and slideshow. Now, if you think about that graphic that we had before, and I'm conscious of the time, we've got about 10 minutes left to share some of this material and maybe to take a couple of questions at the end. We set up, I'll just, Sammy, can you just indicate you can see this before I move on? Um, yep, fantastic. This looks like that um, graphic we had in the picture. Well, we set up a smart apartment in this building on the Gold Coast in Australia. And it was a large two bedroom apartment and we put over 50 devices in there, either connected via 5G powered Wi-Fi or 5G devices themselves. And we thought we want to max out, we want to see what we can do in terms of using all of these devices. I'm going to very quickly share the results. I won't cover all of the slides, but that was the scope. It was about putting, we had a family that lived in there and they invited their friends over uh, to hold a, 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 I guess, a dinner party. Now, what we found in terms of the apartment was this is, this is the floor plan of the apartment. 
we had uh, three 5G routers that were all capable of 20 devices each. So, and we had actual five, we had 4G, uh, we had smartwatches, nine 4G phones, I think four 5G phones and some laptops. And then when we added all of the, we added some monitoring stations. We had one in the living area, one, a, a roaming one in the kitchen and one in the media and games room. When we put all the devices together, this is the 50 odd devices spread through the apartment. Now, how do you, how do you test all of these devices? How do we actually make them all work and to max it out? We thought the best way to do that was to get some teenagers in. So we invited the families and their friends and we gave the teenagers free data and free Wi-Fi or free 5G devices. And their challenge was to use as many as they could and to invite their friends over and literally as they described it, to max out the network. So we thought, well, that's a great challenge. Let's see what we do over the course of the weekend when, they live, when the family were living there normally and we're monitoring the EMF levels in the apartment compared to the dinner party. Now, what do you think your home would look like if you had more than 50 devices and you're all, you know, you're all operating a, you know, a various IoT systems? Well, let's have a look at what we found in this scenario. So these were a couple of pictures of uh, working from home, some smart lights, some Google uh, speakers, uh, cameras that looked out over the coast. This was the picture of the apartment, the balcony, uh, one of the monitoring stations near the home office, one in the media room, and so forth. We had many connected devices in this particular home. Um, in terms of the results, we found the highest level was in the kitchen and living area where the main Wi-Fi routers are that were connected over 5G. So we're going to show you those results over the course of the couple of days. Now, what I want to highlight here is this blue line at the top. This is 10,000 times below that public safety limit that we were talking about before. So if you think about a safety limit that's very conservative, come down 10,000 times, and that's where this line is here. This was the white. In fact, sorry, I've just gone back a page. Um, I don't know what's going on. I'll just move it back. Yep, yeah, sorry. Um, this is 10,000 times below the safety limit. When the family moved into the apartment on the Friday evening, you can see the Wi-Fi increased. The blue line is 5G. So we're over, a, um, that was 10,000. This is 100,000 times below the safety limit. And this was a family of four just getting used to the apartment and using 5G and Wi-Fi. When they woke up in the morning, again, you could see the 5G activity increase and the Wi-Fi activity increase, but all well below. Now, if we switch to the Saturday, when they had the max out challenge, as I called it, when all of the teenagers brought their friends over, you'll see something quite different on the Saturday. Now, this is when we had the dinner party. Uh, of course, the devices were being monitored 24 hours a day. So we were recording the EME levels through the apartment continuously. Now, even though they had family and friends over and their challenge was to use as many devices as they could, whether it was streaming movies, it was doing speed tests, uh, watching high def, uh, yeah, doing high def video and gaming, the, the 5G levels increased slightly, but were still very, very low. Similar to what Sammy was saying, you had a lot of connectivity, but very good efficiency. And the Wi-Fi was very similar. Of course, it dropped off when the family, uh, when the dinner party had finished and back to normal in terms of what a normal family would do. Um, so even when we were maxing out the network, it was still very, very low. On the Sunday and Monday, we were back to normal activities as to what a normal family would see in an apartment with many connected devices. Now, how does that compare to if we could artificially load the network, how would it compare to what the teenagers were able to do for us? Well, we, we ran that test at the end of the session. Uh, and here's a photograph looking out from the apartment at the waterway there. We had our EME test units. We actually connected into a server back in the network where we could artificially transmit as much data as we could over 5G into the apartment or to connect to devices in the apartment. When we did that, this was what we recorded, 0. 0.0014. So very, very low levels if 100% is the standard. When the teenagers maxed it out, they essentially did the same thing. So when the teenagers were loading as many devices as they could, 
they were generating about the same level as we could. And Sammy, this is something that we can help feed into some of the standards work that we're doing. Um, but in terms of what we saw in the apartment, very, very low levels. And this is measuring the devices as well as the network. Um, how did it compare? Well, this was the 100% level. This was the level where the safety limit is, which is very conservative. And we were down here well below, in fact, over 10,000 times below. Interestingly, if you step out on the balcony and you measure the background levels from television and other mobile services, they were in fact higher. So out on the balcony, when we measured the background levels from TV and FM, and in fact, from other mobiles, they were higher than what we had in the connected 5G smart apartment. Now, this is typical of what you might see when you've got you know, the newer technologies powering a lot of your IoT and you've got a lot of activity. And we thought that this was a reasonable test because a lot of people were asking us, what would it be like with everything running in, in a fairly small area? So we thought an apartment might be um, suitable. We had no idea COVID was about to hit and this was gonna be the working and living scenario of many people you know, over the next uh, couple of years. So in terms of what we found, very, very low levels. And I'll just stop the slideshow um, there. Um, so in summary, what we've been able to do with the testing standards, as Sammy was talking about, was on the devices side, as Thomas mentioned, when you measure the devices in the network, very, very low levels. On the network side, similarly, when we load it up, you're getting that efficiency of beam steering and you're getting that efficiency of the network that is enabling those uh, low EMF levels. Now, there's a couple of questions um, uh, that have come in about the safety limits. Uh, and uh, one of the questions was at country specific. And um, these are the international safety limits set by the, um, either the IEEE, uh, International Standards Association, or the International Commission for Non-Ionising Radiation Protection. And they're recognised by the World Health Organisation. They're endorsed by the WHO. And as an IEC and IEEE group, when we set standards, we're developing the standards that test to those limits. So that's the way that the standards work. Um, in terms of um, somebody asked about the power consumption, what we're seeing is if you get really good networks and great connectivity, the power from the radio networks in the devices is improving all the time. So the, the, the energy efficiency of the devices is increasing. And that's why we're seeing those really long battery lives. Now, I know we've almost run out of time uh, and it's been great to share some of this information, but I'll quickly go around to our panelists. Um, uh, Thomas, is there anything you'd like to share in the final minute before we close up? Yeah, perhaps I should mention that ICNIRP is, as you said, not only recognized by the World Health Organization, but also by the International Labor Organization. Yes. So I, I think that's also an important connection and just proves that this is a well-organized environment in which all these standards are developed. One of the, you, you mentioned a really good point. One of the most important things is consistency and the efficiency of networks needs consistent and globally harmonized standards. And that's a, that's a really important point. Um, Ian and Matt, uh, Ian, would you like to offer any final words before we close out? Um, and thank you for your great insights earlier. So uh, I can just jump in and say that um, I think that's a really powerful demonstration uh, of, of what power levels are actually you know, living with. The, the images would speak volumes presented to the IEC um, at, a, at a general meeting, but I think a peer reviewed publication, I think would be very, very useful, which describes the, your, your, your anecdotal household experiment. We did a lot of stuff like that when the world of ultra wideband was being contemplated up against 4G. Yeah. Uh, numbers, numbers argue well, but you've always got to tell the story to the public. So I, I think that was a, yeah. a very compelling story. Thank you, Ian. It's certainly one that we're gonna be sharing globally. Um, and uh, Matt, um, I hope we've shared some of the vision of what 5G is going to deliver from a, from a smart cities perspective. Have you got any final words before we close out? Oh, just to add that, um, again, that that, uh, that that information you've just shared about EME is, yeah, really important as we as we can get that out uh, to, to a wider audience. Um, 
there's a lot of concern about uh, the advent of small cells uh, that will be installed in time that, that use the millimetre wave spectrum um, down at that uh, sort of more wider spread um, suburban street level. And, and there are some perception concerns around uh, EME impacts, um, as well as a bunch of other things around visual amenity and, and, and a whole other, uh, you know, range of things that we won't talk about uh, tonight. But, um, but yeah, it'd be good to, to, you know, get that information and that testing uh, results out into a wider audience just to dispel some of the the issues that we've, uh, that, you know, that we've, that we've got in, in terms of perceptions, um, because, you know, th this will be rolled out. This, this is going to happen. It's, it's all inevitable. Um, you know, it, it's, we, we just need to, um, you know, hopefully mitigate uh, those concerns. Look, small cells are a hugely important aspect of any communication network because it adds to the efficiency. The closer you can bring the connection point, the lower power level that's needed from the small cell and the lower power level that's needed from the network. And, uh, you know, that's why levels inside a smart apartment, as we've just shown, are so low, because you've got great connectivity. Uh, and that's what we want for the community. The more, the better connectivity, the more devices can operate, the lower interference, and it's, uh, it's conserving energy. Uh, look, on that note, I'd like to thank all of the panellists. Uh, we could probably go on for another hour, but that's another session and uh, we're hoping to, we'll certainly make the slides available uh, through the IEC. Um, but thank you to all of those that have been watching online, that watch the replay, have put questions in through the uh, chat and through the uh, earlier question session. And to, again, to all the panelists for their contribution and the IEC for making this possible. We hope you found this informative and we look forward to uh, you know, presenting to you on the next phase of 5G into the future. So thank you very much. And we wish you all a very pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us.